Um, so I'm Vicki Arnett. Welcome to Tuesday Topics. And today we have our local elected officials panel. Um, so I'm very excited that I think everyone has joined us. Um, uh, so I'll let each of you go around and I'll uh, take you in my screen. <laughs> um, order that if you would introduce yourself, tell us what position you hold. Um, Tell us a little bit about what inspired you to run for this office and what you feel like your governing body, uh, what the issues are that are confronting your governing body today. Um, so I'll start on my right, uh, and that's Councilman Duncan. Hello, you can still hear me? Good. Yes. Hello, everybody. Glad to uh, be able to participate, especially as I've been on while now a member of the league, so it's always good to participate on this other side instead of just watching all the presentations all the time. But I am Spencer Duncan, I represent District 8. Uh, why did I run? Well, I actually live in the same district today that I grew up in, so uh, um, it, it means a lot to me to just be able to help the community, and I decided that instead of just complaining on social media about things, I'd throw my name in the ring and put my money where my mouth was. And that's sort of the very short answer of why I ran. So tell us a little bit about what you think the issues are that confront the city council at this point. Well, the obvious one is COVID and I think we all already know what that issue is, which that's a spider web because then it creates other issues that are budgetary and, and health wise and we're looking at things like evictions and, and those all those issue in a bundle and so I think everything at this point, at least for the next few months, comes out of that. Um, but it's not just protection of our community, which is essential. It is also all those other things. I believe that we are going to have an eviction. We, we are having an eviction crisis of some sort, but I think it's going to get worse after the first of the year. Uh, jobs are going to be a problem and small business issues. So I think those, everything sort of stems from that, but they they're each create their own issues we have to deal with. Thank you. Councilwoman Valdivia Alcala. Hi, my name is Christina Valdivia Alcala and I am the city councilwoman for District 2. Um, part of the reason why I ran was because I, I really feel at the point that we're at right now is that we need to let uh, just regular community folks that I live next door and across the street, you know, and down the street from, to let them know that their voice is very pivotal and uh, them staying up to date on local issues is very pivotal. And uh, coming from uh, residing in the same community that I went to school and grew up in, I believe that this is, uh, and we know it to be this district and other districts uh, like District 2 are some of the ones that require uh, the most rehab, uh, the most attention and uh, focus, and people want a strong voice for that. And so that has been my goal in less than a year than I've been seated is uh, to try to be a voice along with uh, the constituents that call in or call for help. Um, some of the issues that I believe are most pressing definitely what uh, Spencer talks about, which is COVID. COVID is getting closer and closer in many parts of the community that at first we're just watching it, you know, from afar. I know within our Mexican American community, uh, we are having more COVID deaths as, as well. So I think the next three months, as, as I was reading uh, an article earlier, the next three months are gonna be very challenging um, for us all. And so I think we just, you know, have to buckle up and, and uh, hold on. And I, and I would also say that at the, the council right now, we've been dealing uh, months now with the affordable housing study. And this is something that I would encourage, you know, uh, everybody to read up on. And the link for the affordable housing study is listed on the city website, because what it states specifically is that yes, there is the need, a need for more affordable housing in Topeka, 
but in the first 33 pages of that study are a number of things that we need to have consistent and ongoing dialogue about. And that is the impact of redlining that still occurs in many of these mm -hmm. at risk, uh, you know, communities and uh, in districts uh, two and, and in three. Uh, also looking at the way that uh, black unemployment and uh, the black family, their rate of eviction uh, is higher uh, in Topeka than Latino and white counterparts. So as we come to look at issues of racial diversity, uh, and I know, you know, we can spend a long time talking the talk, but we really do need to start walking the walk and looking and peering into what is creating this. And one of those things I believe is a living wage. So thanks. Thank you. Um, let me skip back to my left and uh, Commissioner Cook. Kevin Cook, Shawnee County Commission, District 2. One of the reasons why I ran was that I was looking for a way to get back to my community, get involved. Um, I found myself involved in a number of groups and organizations and really wanted to take it to the next level to get involved on the local level and make that impact in the local level with issues of mental health, issues of um, economic disparities. And so those are the things that really attracted me to run for a county commission. The issue that I see uh, hitting the county commission next, um, obviously COVID comes to the top of the list, but it is going to be um, continuing to deal with budgetary constraints and how we work within those constraints and what our priorities are going to be. Additionally, I think we have to keep an eye on what construction costs are going to be. We've had really, really low um, asphalt and uh, those sorts of expenditures. But if we look at to the um, expenditures for wood, for metals, those are gonna go up. And I think that's gonna have an impact on as we look at infrastructure projects. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Mays. Hi, Vicki, thank you for hosting this today. I appreciate it. Um, uh, Aaron Mays, County Commission District 3. Um, I won't speak specific to the County Commission so much as just the reason I ran for elected office in general um, was back in 2017, I had been sort of involved with the Heartland visioning process um, a little bit. And I was uh, getting pretty excited about the momentum that our community had. It's not my dog, mine is sleeping over here. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I was really excited about the momentum that our community had and I wanted to get more involved um, outside of um, just sort of a periphery. And so uh, ran for city council um, for the seat that Elaine Schwartz had vacated at the time. And so uh, was elected. I've been um, proud to be a part of it, uh, to be a part of this community in, in a leadership role. Um, I would say the biggest issue that I see facing our community is the division of our citizens right now. And that's something that we can all work together to, to fix. Um, once COVID's behind us, which hopefully is uh, sooner rather than later, um, I think there's a lot of healing that needs to happen and it's not going to happen unless we start to um, work together as a team um, rather than fighting with one another. So um, I, I think that's probably the biggest issue in our community. And that's not unique to Topeka and Shawnee County, but um, I, I think it, what's unique about us is that I think we have the ability to do it. Thank you. Councilwoman Hiller. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm Karen Hiller and I represent City Council District 1. And I ran originally and, and today because I like people. Uh, I love people, love community, and am challenged by problem solving and running for elected office seemed to be a pretty good fit. Um, at the time, I too was involved in, in Heartland Visioning, but what we needed was momentum. <laughs> and so it was a challenging time to step in back in 2009. Um, and it has it satisfied all those things. We, we've got a lot going. In terms of current issues, I would echo what my colleagues have said. Um, in particular, um, police and community issues are big. And um, we're, 
we're steadily now actively and steadily in the process of taking them down from what people saw on the national news and, and concerned them and, and their experiences here and pulling them down into what exactly is happening here locally, how does it fit, and um, what can we do? Are there some things that we do need to do to make a difference? And, and I'm pleased to say that that appears at this point. I, I serve on the, the Special Committee on Police and Community Relations to be a collaborative process that many people are participating in and or watching. And that, that's really important to, to rebuilding community. We are also in, in, even through COVID, very much in a process of revitalization and redevelopment in the city of Topeka. Uh, it's amazing how much is still bubbling, um, even through COVID, new businesses opening and, and new initiatives beginning. Um, we're really proceeding with vigor, but there's more to do. And I itemize, it's dizzying sometimes, downtown, NOTO, the Highway 24 corridor, uh, the riverfront, um, East Topeka Learning Center and other developments in East Topeka, various neighborhoods, the Wheatfield development way down at 29th and Fairlawn, um, Wanamaker redevelopment, and of course, White Lakes, things that are in various stages of attention and redevelopment. Related to that, we and cities all over the country have, have infrastructure that's over 100 years old, under the ground where you can't see it, but falling apart daily. And so, uh, watching dollars as well as strategies to work as smart as we can to get that infrastructure replaced without being burdensome on the on the taxpayers. Uh, those are just three big areas that have lots of moving parts that I and 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 others, all the others are involved in. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me ask uh, Councilman Dobler, do you have enough time to introduce yourself before you have to um, go out and come back? <laughs> yeah, I sh uh, certainly. And I can, I can speak for a couple minutes here. Um, Neil Dobler, uh, City Council District 7. I was actually appointed by the rest of the council about a year ago to fill the vacated seat of, of Commissioner Mays. Um, and he left it fairly warm, so I appreciated that. Um, I, I took the opportunity to run for that uh, seat, to be appointed to it, uh, because I've got a background in, in city government. I've seen it from a couple of different uh, angles over the years. Uh, I also have a background in infrastructure, which uh, I, I think is a always a huge issue for a, a municipality this size. Um, and that's what I want to talk about for just a minute. Uh, obviously, there's, there's some huge issues out there, COVID and, and uh, equity and other things that have been mentioned. Um, but I think one of, the, one of the bigger issues facing this community is growth and where that growth occurs. Um, we really can't afford to grow much outside of, of our existing boundaries. Um, we're running out of, of utilities. They're expensive to build. And yet we have just, just amazing neighborhoods uh, kind of in the center of the city that, that are being vacated. And we need to figure out how to redevelop those neighborhoods. Um, and it's 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 a big issue. The infrastructure is already there. We don't have to go in and rebuild infrastructure, build streets, put in new sewers and water and things like that. It's already there. So um, I think the the ability to address the issues we've got right now with with housing um, as well as neighborhoods in in certain parts of the city uh, can be addressed with a with a good plan to redevelop those areas. So I'll just leave it at that. I appreciate the opportunity and I will try to get back on in a few minutes if I can. Okay, very good, very Thank good. You. Thank you. Um, and I, I also understand that um, Ms. Mayor De La Isla needs to leave us. So I'm gonna skip around a little bit here and ask her if she would introduce herself and um, 
So thank you so much for this opportunity. I am excited to be here and see all my colleagues. Um, this is another great way that you get to see through the League of Women Voters that your city and your county do work together and we actually do like each other, um, <laughs> which is something that hasn't happened in probably a while. Um, but this, this city council has worked diligently to ensure that the relationships that we have with our brothers um, up north from us are, are positive um, and that, that we are working together. And you can see that happening through this pandemic. Um, I decided to run because very much like Councilwoman Valdivia Alcala, I did not, uh, I, I wasn't born here. I came to this community. She was born here, she was raised here, but what I was gonna say is the contact with people. And uh, I will never forget getting involved with a group of volunteers that were talking about downtown redevelopment and they wanted to have the perspective of young people involved in downtown. And I didn't understand at all what was happening. I didn't understand about infrastructure. What I did understand was bringing people together um, so that they can talk about the destiny and the future of their community. And I had never showed up at a council meeting and I'll never forget coming with my kids and sitting down through these meetings and sitting in the, in the orange chairs and watching this towering bench where people were making these decisions and we just could not understand why they were not listening to the will of people. And um, it was after several times of trying that one of our young, uh, my young, one of my young mentees, Michelle Hubbard, spoke up and she wasn't the reason that it got approved. But I think that she was one of the really impactful reasons that helped sway the, the voters that were on the council that were not 100% sure if downtown investment of $5 million was worth it. But I will never forget that she stood up and she said, downtown sucks. And I surveyed 100 of my fellow students and they said that if you don't do anything to keep us here in this community, we're all gonna leave. So if you don't do anything about it, you're gonna lose us. And that day, that, that vote, got passed and I'll never forget thinking, oh my gosh, there's a way that you could bring people together to start creating and affecting change in your community. We need to get more of this. So, so that's how I got involved. Um, I'll never forget uh, Mayor Wolgas encouraging me to run for the council and, um, and then just falling in love with this community and wanting to make sure that I could help make the name of Topeka known uh, for other things, not just for the things that people typically associated our community with that typically are not that positive. Um, I think that the biggest issues that we have, I would talk to the first one that uh, Councilman May, uh, Commissioner May said, which is we need to unify our community. Let's make no mistake to the fact that our community and our country is divided. Um, we're divided on issues of race. Uh, we thought that we were done with that. We're not. We're divided on issues of science and we're divided on issues of, of how we are treating each other at the police level, at the local level, at the housing level. There's a lot of disparities that we, because have not had these conversations, are having to deal with immediately. And I think that COVID came along to show us a lot of those things, to show us how there's challenges in the way that we communicate and our viewpoints of the world. Um, and that compound that on top of the fact that we have budgets that we have to take care of. We have potholes that we have to fill. We have fire and police department positions that we must ensure that we have available so that we can continue to safeguard our public safety. We have neighborhoods of families that need sidewalks. Um, we have to look at our social determinants of health so that we have health in all of the policies that we're putting in place. Um, so the issues that we have are pretty significant. And all of those issues are dealt with at the local level. I'm excited that throughout this horrible time, because make no mistake, these times are definitely not easy. We are surrounded and this city and this county has a significant amount of good leaders that really care about the community's well-being, about not just our health, but our economic well-being, and about how do we leave for future generations a community that they can all be proud of. So those are the things that we are looking at small things, right? Um, and um, I'm excited that the people that I'm working with are top notch. Thank you. Uh, now, let me go back to Commissioner Rippon. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Well, I'm, uh, I'm Commissioner Bill Rippon. I'm, uh, I represent District 1. Um, 
You know, I, I think the reason I ran is because I, I just had good experience in uh, uh, managing projects, working with parks and recreation for 30 some years, worked with neighborhoods all over the city, NIAs, neighborhood associations, and, and just a whole bunch of other different organizations. Uh, it just gave me a good perspective of, of all the different neighborhoods that make up Topeka and Shawnee County. Also, I, I, you know, I grew up on a farm in uh, western Kansas, but uh, uh, it, it gave me a good, uh, good feel for, for the farming communities that we have here in this area, Rossville, Dover, Silver Lake. And uh, so uh, I, I think with that experience, it, I felt like I had a lot to contribute to Shawnee County. And when I was finished being a park planner, which I did for 32 years, I, I, I was, uh, I, I still had a little bit of energy left in me and I, I thought I can contribute. And I, I thought this is a good way for me to, to do that. So this is kind of my way of giving back. Uh, as far as uh, issues that I see with, uh, with the county right now, uh, I think we, we have issues with our jail. We need to, we need to be able to uh, recruit and retain uh, uh, people for our jail. I think that's critical at this point. Uh, COVID, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel like we're about to turn a corner. Uh, we're talking about doing some mass uh, vaccinations uh, using the Expo or the Stormont Vale, Stormont vale Event Center. And I think once we get that going, we'll, we'll really turn the, turn the corner on this virus and get back to a, what, what, we, what we used to call normal. And uh, so I'm looking forward to that as well. Um, we have some other smaller issues, I think, that, uh, that are coming up that are surfacing. We, we, we took on the Great Oberlin Station. Of course, with the COVID, it's kind of hard to rent out a building for 200 people or 300 people when you, when you have a uh, restriction on, on how many people you can have in a space, but you know that, that, that will take care of itself as we get a hold of this virus a little better. Uh, we're also looking at a, a new park on the west side of town, a, a family park, and we've been going through a planning process with that right now. So those are just some of the things I see on the horizon. So that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Padilla. Good morning, Vicki. Thank you uh, for hosting and asking us to participate. This is a, a good forum. I like this. Um, you know, everybody's touched on COVID, of course, uh, and some of the other issues. Uh, for me, when uh, I decided to run, I had a good friend who encouraged me to do so, and uh, uh, Mayor Wolgas and our current mayor, Michelle de Reisla, were very supportive of my decision to run. Uh, I came to it, I think, as a natural progression of my professional career. Uh, people talk a lot about police officers and what they see, what they do, what they hear. Um, and I tell you, it's one of the best jobs you can have to see all of this city and to see it when it's shining and see it when it needs some shining. And so that's what I spent a lot of time doing in my career is not just looking at the law enforcement aspect of it, but I involved myself with the community through a number of um, private organizations, uh, Safe Streets, uh, Salvation Army, uh, Midland Care, uh, to name a few, Meals on Wheels. I, I entered into those with the idea that I could use my knowledge of the city to help those organizations expand their services in an equitable way across the city. And I know that uh, our uh, representatives uh, like myself, I represent District 5, are, we get our votes from those constituents in that area. But I know myself and my colleagues look at the overall well being of this community. You have to. It can't be in segments, it has to be as a holistic approach. And so that's where. I felt like I was not ready to retire in, in the sense that I was not ready to give up on this city at all because I could still see the potential. Uh, for every person who says there's something bad, I can counter with something that's good about this city. And I think that's the positive approach that has been brought uh, to this council and to this kind of commission. And that's one of the things that uh, I wanted to bring up and uh, kind of touched on it uh, with uh, uh, Commissioner Ripple and, and uh, 
Mays, is that is, I think at the core of it, uh, both governing bodies have seen an improved relationship, I believe, in my years as a lifelong citizen in the city of Topeka. I can see where the defining lines of what is county, what is city, uh, maybe get a blurred a little bit when we decide that what is good for one is good for the rest of us. And working to that end, I think is important because as our finances dwindle, our resources dwindle, our capabilities uh, um, are restricted, that more and more it's important for us to collaborate. And so for me, uh, that's the one thing that I have truly seen gel and enjoy as part of the council since I have joined. Um, you know, I think it was fortuitous that Councilman Mays, who uh, I enjoyed working very well with on the city council, uh, enjoy his comments, his uh, insight. And now that he's at the county level, it's kind of like an extension uh, or a mole, as you might say, uh, over into the county commissioner's offices. And, and I think that helps because it gives, I think, a good perspective for all of us. And I like listening to what uh, the commissioners say. And I think it's important that we coordinate our efforts as a governing body uh, so that we're most efficient in what we can provide. Uh, I do think that there is some uh, need, like uh, Commissioner Ripon said, to think about the outlying cities of Silver Lake, Rossville, and, and Dover, and, and, and not forget about their needs as well, because the city of Topeka can uh, take up a lot of your attention because there's a lot going on here and that's where the largest population is but that doesn't mean the rest of us don't need to give some thought and consideration to those other communities and so i think again whatever we can do uh, to collaborate on the similar issues uh, you hear a lot about people saying we more alike than we are different well if that's true then when we're problem solving we solve for everybody not just for a few and so that's why i was not ready to give up my efforts to keep continuing to work for the betterment of this community in any way I can. I know that I can't make the change, but I know as a team, as a group, change can come from a concerted effort. And so I want to be part of that change as long as I can. And for me, it's been an enjoyable and very uh, enlightening experience. I have been able to continue to uh, meet more people who are, as you call decision makers, but I also am able to meet more people who are affected by those decisions. And I think that's the thing that we still have to keep in mind as we move forward with our ideas and our projects. We may think it's a great idea, but we haven't taken into consideration how those people affected will think about our great idea, then we might be off the mark. And so I still wanna be able to bring that other perspective uh, to our discussions and our communications as a group and so for me, I look forward to continuing this effort. This is a good body. I think uh, everyone has a good heart. And I think if we continue to focus on that, and, and we will get a lot more done because it's going to take all of that effort in the next coming months. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you. Uh, and now, Councilwoman Ortiz, who wins the League Patience Award because she's been here the longest today. You're still on mute here. We had you. Here we Thank go. You. Thank you. Sorry about that. Right. Got a different machine today. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Vicki, I want to say thank you for the invite. It's It's been a pleasure. And it's also been a pleasure to sit back and listen to all my colleagues and um, everything that they have to say. So I guess there is some a reward in going last. Um, first, I want to say that um, I was the NIA president for over 15 years in East Topeka South. And um, after being a president and taking some of our ideals to the council, um, and then they they were just shot down. Um, I decided to run for office. I felt like um, 
we needed somebody from the grassroots that people knew um, and being a lifelong resident of district three um, I felt like um, I could people I understood the people I understood um, their language and what they wanted and what what really mattered to them in our area um, I understood the cracks in the streets I understood the no sidewalks the ditches um, the narrow streets and um, so I decided to run and um, been been in it for for quite a while um, I also um, wanted more things for our kids to do. Um, I feel like um, we don't do enough for our children. Um, we need to offer them more. They are the next generation of our citizens, and as well as um, training them to be a part of the city. I think we need to give them the buy-in that they're, they're happy um, and they want to be a part of um, Topeka. Um, I love Topeka and we have to make our youth love Topeka as well. We have to give them the opportunity to help our elderly who need that help. Um, when I look at, you know, um, things for them to do and, and people say, well, yes, there, there is things for them to do. They can go swimming. They can come over here and, and go to Gage Park or go to the zoo. That all takes money. So being a single mother and having kids and knowing that if you have five kids, it's, it's hard to enroll all of them in the swimming. You know, I remember um, when I was young, I won't tell you how old I am, but, you know, Ripley had free swimming for kids. And I think we need to get back to that. Um, you know, Ripley was really, really booming with that. Um, and I think those are the things that I look at. Um, and so that's why I decided, decided to run. Um, and and I, still, I still do. I think we need to continue to look at ways that we can help the elderly and help our youth um, so they can, they can buy into that. Um, this, the challenges that we face today, of course, is the covert. Um, what I see is hunger. Um, when you have all these free boxes going out and you have not only people that are not working, but the working poor, that, that says a lot. Um, I like to connect the dots um, with people. Um, and I think that's a big issue that we have that we just don't give them the information in a timely manner. And we need to do that because there's people out there that are deserving and that need that. Just like I'll put a little plug in for Salvation Army on December 4th, they're gonna start giving out free coats. Right now you can go to your closet, get your coats and take them to Scotch and they're collecting them um, for that drive. Um, and that's just something that we need to continuously keep on our calendar because there's a lot of people in need. Um, also, um, it concerns me with the kids that are on remote um, in our public health and safety. And I, I'm grateful for Neil. He kind of kind of brought this to us before. And so we're trying to help all the kids get on remote because and this is kind of going to be the new norm for a while. Um, and so um, if you are a 501 student and you need to get on and you don't have the internet, uh, we need you to um, ask your school to send you the link and or you can contact me or um, uh, Karen Hiller or Neil Dobler and we will help you to get um, situated. We have board members that are um, under, not understanding why their Zoom and stuff doesn't work. Uh, now with me, it's probably I just didn't hit the right key. But there's other people that they, they, they don't have it. It's free and we need to link them up so that they can get that. Um, and, and I think that's, that's very, very important. And, and we've had discussion about the elderly and trying to get them involved and keep them in contact um, with their loved ones as well. Um, I agree with Aaron. I, I agree that we need to mend and it's gonna take a lot to mend. It's gonna take all of us to put our differences aside. Um, to mend um, because our city is divided. Um, but I think we can do that. We're the heartland and, and, and we've always um, been proud of that, um, being the heartland. And, and so I think that we can do that. And then I think the rest will fall in line. Um, you know, we've always had issues with our streets and our structures and our economic development. And we've always had that, but I think that will fall in line. Um, as we as we come together and really look at what people need 
Um, I think in some ways COVID has brought people together. I'm seeing more people do for each other. I'm seeing um, more people look out for each other. Um, whether it's um, to tell them where a site is or uh, for free meals or to make sure that they know this about the school or whatever. And so I think we need to continue continue to do that. I think Topeka prides herself on that is, is this is a giving city. It's always been a giving city. We have the rescue mission, you know, um, that went out to our homeless people and handed out plates. Um, and, I, and I think as long as we continue to take care of each other and take care of others and not look at ourselves, um, that's, that's what, what will bring us through this. Um, and because because we're going to have to get used to the new norm for a while. I, I hope that Commissioner Ripon is right that we're going to take a turn, but I'm, you know, I'm looking at the numbers and I'm not feeling that. And I have a lot of friends that work at Stormont that, you know, that are constantly, constantly looking at their numbers and when our hospitals are full, but we could all do our part and, um, continue to make Topeka the best place that it, that it could be. And, um, and continue to listen to our young people, our young adults, our young people. Um, and I'm just very proud of the people that I serve with. I feel like they listen to me um, as opposed to, you know, they hear me. Um, but I, uh, to the commissioners, I feel like they listen to me um, when I call and, and, and I have an issue. They get on it and they try to, they try to do something about it as opposed to, uh, there's been a time before where they would just hear me. Um, and I think everybody has that willing spirit to do something um, to the city council members. This is probably the hardest working city council members that I've worked with and they're working, they're working. Um, they're constantly trying to figure what they can do, how they can do it better. Um, and and um, I'm glad to serve on um, city council. Um, and I do represent District 3, which is most of um, East Topeka and some of Oakland and some of, and some of South Topeka and some of Central Topeka. My district's cut up kind of funny, but um, I, I like it and I just like serving the people. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Nagger. Thanks so much. Um, I'm going to try to keep it short because we're pretty far into our meeting already. Um, my name is Hannah Nager. I represent the sixth district of the city of Topeka. Um, that's pretty much the residential little core of historical neighborhoods that are in central Topeka. Um, I ran because I am a born and raised Topekan. Um, I'm probably the youngest uh, governing body member on this call and in our local government. And um, I was very excited to get involved in a way that I hadn't gotten to in the past. I grew up in a family that was always very involved in um, neighborhood associations and different volunteering capacities. And so this was um, a very natural extension for me. And it's been wonderful to have the opportunity to serve in this way. Um, it's been a very exhausting year to serve, but it's been very rewarding. And as far as the issues, we've really covered them very in depth. Um, and I just echo what others have said before me. COVID is something that has highlighted the inequalities that have, our, that have always been in our community. And I hope that we take the lessons from this year, that we learn from them, that we heal from them, and that we build a more equitable community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we, uh, we have time for uh, probably 15 minutes of questions and um, I think if, if you want to answer this question, why don't you just get my attention in your uh, Hollywood Square here and um, I'll, I'll call on you and, and we can go from there. Um, so the first question, um, you know, and I, I won't direct this to the city or the county, but, you know, it, it is something that's important to the league um, relative to what do you think, um, uh, the city or county can do to increase access to voting. You know, we just came off the November 3rd election. It went really, really well. Um, and we had record turnout. 
but how do you feel like we can build on that enthusiasm and availability of the ballot? Mr. Riffon. Uh, yeah, I, oh, I think we did an excellent job on, on uh, with our election this year. As you mentioned, we had a record turnout, and yet we, we handled the crowds very well. You know, there, you have to be always careful about security when you start expanding your, your voting. And I, I you know, I, that's a big concern when you, when you start expanding because, you know, if you add days, you're, you're adding more time to your staff and, and there, there's a lot of concerns with, uh, with expanding sometimes. I know we've, we've been approached before about uh, having uh, more days uh, voting at the library, different locations. But once again, it's a security issue as much as anything. But I, I think we do an excellent job of handling uh, the crowds that we have. Um, people have a lot of different options on how they vote. Uh, they can do mail in. We have early balloting. Uh, we had drop boxes this year, which we put on a trailer, which I thought was 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 really brilliant uh, move on our on the part of our uh, election commissioner uh, to, to not just put put two drop boxes in concrete somewhere, but to actually have them on a trailer where you had better security because those uh, trailer was staffed by, by personnel that we have and, uh, and, and we're able to hit a lot of locations. So I thought we did a great job. So, I don't know. Do you think keeping the drop maybe boxes the, will be something that we do? Keeping the drop boxes, maybe even expanding the number of drop boxes? Uh, you know, I. I think I think what we did this year was was very adequate. I thought it worked great. Uh, you know, we we uh, we had a number of locations. I think it was like 10, 11, 12 locations, but we hit all those locations twice. We did we did all of them one week and then the following week. So I I think that worked out very well. Uh, once again, you start adding drop boxes, you add more trailers and personnel, and uh, I think we have adequate coverage with it right now. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to, um, I was kind of looking at the Q&A box here. Um, you know, it's my uh, understanding that um, the uh, Human Relations Commission has made recommendations about expanding um, uh, basically civil rights uh, and protections within the city uh, to LGBTQ folks. So. What, what can you bring us up to date on that? Uh, Councilman Nager. Thanks so much. So yes, tonight we're going to be discussing the addition of several different um, per, several modifications to our current non-discrimination ordinance. Sorry, I just had to rush to another room and so I'm a little breathing um, but those include sexual orientation sexual identity um, genetic information veteran and veteran status and another thing that they worked hard at including was changing from just harassment over the phone to harassment over telecommunications because obviously in the 21st century there's a lot more than just phones um, this has been something that has been in the works in different capacities for about um, that I know of two years. And I know that it started earlier than that. Um, and it was really spurred by a movement that was statewide encouraging the state legislation legislator to um, consider putting these rights into our state constitution. Um, what was told to activists at that point was, hey, if, I mean, if it's really needed, um sure but we're not seeing that there's that push and so many grassroots um, organizations and cities took it upon themselves to go ahead and show to the legislature that this is something that's very important to kansans um, and this is this was really um something that was already existing in topeka and was spurred on by that call to action and so over the past two years um different entities, including um, the Topeka Human Relations Commission, um, different city council members, and 
um, our city legal department have been working on making sure that we're creating something that is going to support individuals who do face discrimination based on who they love, who they see themselves as, who they are as people. And we also wanted to make sure that as we were going through and updating everything, that we were covering other areas of concern like harassment over telecommunications and making sure that people who have served our country are protected and that um, with the genetic information, making sure that people, especially whenever you have something as fun as finding out about what your genetic background is as far as your heritage, that information can also be used um, to discriminate against individuals who might have a predisposition to different diseases. And so we wanna make sure that we're doing what we can at the city level to support um, these individuals. It might not be the defining um, argument in somebody's civil rights um, in court, but it's gonna be something that not only gives people an extra girder of support from us, but it also is a symbolic lend of support to these individuals and to make sure that we're a friendly community that's open to all. You're still on mute. I'm still on mute. Commissioner Duncan, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Oh, well, I was talking to my wife, but I, I will say two, the, the proposal is going to be presented for HRC. I'll just say two things. It has two components to it. One is related to housing discrimination. The other is employment discrimination. I think I would hope that there's not a single person out there that has a disagreement that we should ever in any capacity on any level discriminate against someone in housing. I don't think we should discriminate on any level regardless of it. The only concerns I've heard to this point have been some from the business community. And what I've said to them is, if you have some suggestions that we can serve both of these issues, make sure that whatever concerns you have are addressed, but also guarantee that those protections are in place and I'm willing to listen. But from my perspective, I think this proposal coming before us needs some adjustments, but as a whole, just if people wanna know, I'm supportive of what it's trying to accomplish overall. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, and would this be um, on a like first reading? Will you make decisions tonight? Um, should league members be tuning in? I believe tonight is just the initial presentation to the council of what it looks like, and then it's our job to take it from there and decide what we want to do next. Thank you. Um, so I want to I want to ask you another question that is uh, an important issue to the league. Um, that being that um, we just finished the 2020 census. Uh, and they'll begin to crunch the numbers and finesse the data. Uh, but I believe, uh, if my uh, thinking is correct, that in by 2022, uh, both city council districts and county commission districts will undergo a redistricting process as well. Can you tell us your thinking about how you'll approach that redistricting? Councilwoman Hiller. Well, I, I've been through it once. Um, it's really a numbers issue. Um, first, you see what, what happened to the population in each precinct. Even though we're local government, our districts are built on the same precincts that all the other ones are. And so we have in our charter um, literal numbers that, that the, um, the district are all supposed to be within five points of one ninth of the population. We, uh, what happened before, and I believe it's, it's either in an ordinance or in our charter, is that commission is formed to do that. A citizen commission is formed. But what they have to do is, is um, kind of challenging game of looking at the numbers and figuring out whether if, if if any or all of the districts are off, they have to figure out precinct by precinct how to rejuggle those um, precincts um, to to fit that the to make the numbers work. And um, 
you heard Councilwoman Ortiz talk about how her, her district, she's kind of sandwiched in between border districts and, and they have to do some kind of funny things to make them balance. Um, and, and we don't control the reapportionment. That is a state thing that hasn't happened in a long time. And I see Spencer chiming in. If you want more about reapportionment, maybe you can ask him. But uh, I have one district that only had 99 voters and another one that had over 500. And it's tricky. But that's, that's the process. It takes about a year and then gets voted on by the council. Do you um, do you know when the uh, citizens commission would be formed um, to provide input or um, some well input into that process? I haven't looked that far ahead yet, but it is it's it's fairly clear as, as I recall in our uh, municipal code. Uh, but it might be something that's formed in 2021, which is just around the corner after we get vaccinated, we'll all wanna be a part of that commission. I don't think it's that soon. I wanna say that we redistricted in around 2017. So you might wanna check the, the rotation on that. Thank you, thank you. Um, so at the, um, I mean, we've all talked about COVID uh, having such a dramatic impact on the way all of us do business and carry on our lives. Um, but can you tell us uh, a little bit about what you've learned um, or experienced about the role of government, uh, the role that government plays and that government officials play in terms of emergency management, and public health. Does anybody want to answer that? Commissioner Cook? I, I, thank you. I think that uh, what we found out is that um, we have a lot more um, to do than we thought we did before the pandemic. Um, it's pointed out where we have strengths, um, where we have some weaknesses, um, and where we need to maybe kind of reallocate some of our resources. And that's been the big learning point during the pandemic um, from a county commission's perspective. And what things, I mean, there's, uh, we draw up the plans all the time of con continuity of government. And this has had an opportunity to really put some of those into place. Um, who would have thought that a year ago we would be doing a Zoom meeting like today? Um, many of our employees are working from home. Um, many of us are working remotely. And I think that's been a big part of the government is how do you maintain transparency? How do you maintain um, access to government, but still do that in a safe way? Thank you. Um... Let me check the Q&A box here real quick. Um, so um, we had a question about um, uh, what are some of the downsides related to um, uh, restaurants going to such curbside pickup and more closures. Um, um, so I know that the governing body, at least the city, made some ordinance changes in order to allow for things like um, drive-through margaritas at Spangler's. Does anybody want to respond to how the changes have impacted us? Commissioner Ripon. Yeah, I, I think, uh... <laughs> For some restaurants, it, it probably didn't hurt them as much where they had drive up windows. But uh, you take a, a, a nice restaurant where people are used to going in and sitting down and having a meal. People aren't as likely to go get grab and go carry out food from a restaurant like that. They want to go in and have a nice meal. Uh, so I think it really hurts the some of the restaurants in that regard. Um, you know, a lot of the fast food, it's no big deal for people to go go to the drive up window. 
so I think it kind of depends on what uh, what type of restaurant you're running. Sure, sure. Um, so let me. One thing that hasn't been mentioned um, um, is um, we do have a question about living wage. What what does the governing body? Um, what did, what's your thinking or your thoughts or the work that you've done about um, increasing minimum wage in the city and the county and um, moving towards a living wage? The promotion of women and minorities. So, Councilwoman Valdivia Alcala, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm relatively new to the council, having served less than a year. Um, I don't know if this is something that has to go through the state legislature for an increase in the minimum wage or if this is something that the city can do. I, I, would, I would look to uh, the elder uh, council people to tell me that. But what I can say is that we need to start having the dialogue, whether if we cannot do it at, this, at the uh, city level, then you know, still continue to start to have this dialogue so that you know we can task our lobbyist you know to take this as one of the priorities to the state legislature more and more you're looking at the need for a living wage if you again if you look at the housing study you're looking at you know a, a large number of folks are not earning enough to rent a decent uh, safe two bedroom including utilities so, uh, you know, what I would imagine is if we want the best for Topeka, that, you know, we don't want to see this, you know, this constant creation and, and development more and more for social service agencies to help those that cannot afford, you know, uh, any number of things. And I know that COVID has, has put a, a, a real, you know, twist on this, but however, it, it still, is worth having the conversation because you know the the rate that we're at now which is what the 725 or whatever who can live on that who can live on that and what kind of stressors does that put uh you know on families on often single families on often you know folks of color and single mothers so it is not one of the most um attractive uh, uh you know, trendy type, type of topics to discuss, but it really is a hard topic that we need to start bringing up. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Rippon. Can I chime in on that just a little bit? Uh, yeah. You know, on the flip side of, of, of raising your minimum wage too high is it can have a uh, profound in, impact on, on young people, uh, teenagers trying to get a job. There'll be people who won't hire them because they don't want to pay $15 an hour for someone who doesn't have experience. A lot of times we have the, 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 these minimum wage. Yeah, it's not something you can live on if the family of four, but it does uh, uh, give a, a teenager an opportunity to get experience and to, to, to get into the workforce. Um, you know, I don't, yeah, I don't think people can live on that, but a lot of times it's, it's just getting experience. And if you, if you get that living wage or living wage or minimum wage, whatever you want to call it up too high, you're going to hurt, uh, you're going to hurt young people getting a job. And I look at places like Parks and Rec. We hire hundreds of kids during the summer to work in camps and pools and uh, softball fields and things like that. How will it impact that? It will, uh, it will have a, it will have a huge impact on the budget if it has to, if you have to pay that kind of money. So uh, it's, it's something that needs to be studied, but uh, there, there is there is a flip side to it. Thank you, Commissioner. Can I chime? Can I? Oh, okay. Uh, go ahead, Ken. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Aaron. Well, I, I was just going to say I, I think that it, this is an issue that probably needs to be handled at the state level for a couple of reasons, um, and and what sticks in my mind first and foremost is the bidding war between communities that, you know, if Topeka sets our minimum wage at $13 an hour, and then Lawrence sets theirs at 15, um, and, and young workforce starts going to another community to work, um, it, it just isn't feasible long term. I think this is kind of what we see 
between city and county sometimes with the sheriff versus the TPD. We talk about their wages all the time. Well, the sheriff pays this. No, the TPD pays that. And I, I think that's why it needs to be done at the state level. Uh, if, if it's going to be done at all, um, I think that's the, pl the appropriate place if it's not coming from the feds. Thank you. Commissioner Cook? I concur with those statements made by Commissioner Mays, but I think that one area that we as the city and the county have a huge impact on working wages and livable wages is when it comes to JADO. As the Joint Economic Development Organization, we are responsible for overseeing incentives to new businesses and new employers. And when we look at those employers, we have to look at what kinds of employers are we attracting? Are we offering incentives to businesses that their wages are only $20,000 a year or $25,000 a year, as opposed to offering incentives to businesses that have wages at fifty dollars or $60,000 a year. And I think that's part of the discussion when we look at what incentives JADO um, proposes and what we do is how we incentivize companies to come to Topeka. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, uh, Councilman Duncan, I think that you, um, had a comment about um, restaurant carry out, restaurant business. And I'm not sure everybody could see it in the chat box if you wanted to speak to it. Oh, sure. I was just answering some of those questions. I mean, I, I understand the concern that we know that bars and restaurants uh, are can become hot spots. We know that. Um, but I think that the rules that have been put in place give us the best of both worlds. I think which shows if everyone follows the capacity rule, and, and the restaurants, the majority of which are doing a great job of putting up barriers and keeping masks and capacity, then we should be okay. And I also remind people, and, and I understand Commissioner Rippon's point that there may be some select restaurants, it's a little more difficult. But I'll tell you what, since this started, my wife and I were from almost everywhere, including some high, nicer restaurants. And they have all, they are all very smart. They have figured out how to package it, get it to you. So you can still support your restaurants by picking up curbside and to go. I mean, my wife and I do it every, we do it a few times, but every Thursday we make sure we support a local, a local restaurant and it is very doable. So that's what I tell people. There is a personal responsibility aspect to this of just everyone has done curbside retail, res, retail restaurants, bars, we have cocktails to go. You can utilize all of those. Um, and that way we won't have to shut everything down and we, and we can still sort of make sure that our businesses are supported. So it, it's, I think we're hitting it on both ends pretty well. We put some rules in place without having to shut down, but support them in every way you can by using those innovations they've come up with the last couple months. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, I was gonna say the French onion soup from Chege Azu sound tastes just the same. So uh, are there any other uh, remarks that anybody wants to make in closing today, and I do appreciate everybody attending. This has been a really nice experience to come together on Zoom. Um, anything else that... Um, Councilwoman Hiller, did you want to... Okay, all right. Uh, I appreciate you coming. I do want to uh, tell our members that are um, still on that uh, on Tuesday, January the 5th, we will hear from the recently retired by then, Dr. Pizzino. Um, so don't plan to join us back here on Zoom on January the 5th. And if I don't see anyone, please have a nice, safe holiday. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.